Okay. All right. So like I already alluded to, uh, this is the second week. We're talking about achieving independence. And before we go really much further at all, I just want to take a second um, to pause and make sure that people are clear when we say intervention, when we say activity, um, that there is actually a difference between an activity and an intervention. When you do your progress note, if you'll remember, you'll choose an intervention and then underneath the interventions are a variety of activities that you can select from. And I just wanna take a second here to see if anybody um, could explain the difference between an activity versus an intervention. And then we'll get into the actual sort of textbook definition of the two here in a second. But any volunteers to take a stab at the difference between an intervention and activity, just go ahead and unmute. Or if you'd rather type it in the chat, uh, that's fine as well. Is an intervention the broad category and activity the specific thing you did with the client? Yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's a great way to explain it. Absolutely. Yeah, anybody else? Intervention versus activity. Because there is there is a difference. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. Okay. Well, let's talk about kind of the nitty-gritty. Um, basically, what Sarah just said, the intervention is kind of the broad service provided to the client. I think of it as what you did with the client. The activity, on the other hand, is kind of the tool that the TBS used to provide the service. So how you help them work towards their particular goal. Um, I kind of think of it as if the intervention is building a birdhouse, how did you build the birdhouse? With wood, with nails, with a hammer, with glue, with paint. So the activity would be, what did you do to build the birdhouse? And the intervention is building a birdhouse, if you want to use that. Um, kind of example. So um, I'll use these words, intervention activity. Um, I just want you guys to understand that there is a difference. Um, and we need both you know, information about um, why did you do that particular intervention? Why did you use that particular activity? This is kind of the golden thread of medical necessity sort of showing based on these symptoms, I chose this general intervention, but based on this client's you know, specific symptoms that they're experiencing, maybe just today, I chose this specific activity, this um, skill building activity, this particular coping skill to work on to help them achieve kind of their overall goal. So I just wanted to make sure um, people were clear on the difference because we throw these words around and I want to make sure we're kind of all on the same page. So intervention and activity are different. And then as it relates to our Ohio Administrative Code, there is a portion of the Ohio Administrative Code that is specific to helping a client work towards independence. And the one that we're looking at today is letter E. We're looking at really restoring the client's daily functioning, assisting the individual to restore daily functioning, specific to things like managing their own home, managing their money, um, understanding and managing their medications, uh, using and ac accessing community resources, and then just other kind of self-care um, activities and requirements. So again, just to refresh, we wanna make sure um, that we are in our note referencing the intervention, referencing the activity. And if we are working towards achieving independence as being the broad intervention, we know that the services that you're providing, the activities that you're doing um, are reimbursable by Medicaid because they are sort of provided for in the Ohio Administrative Code. So that's why we like to touch on that um, pretty much almost every week, just to remind you of why we have the 10 interventions and why it's so important to uh, reference back to what you did, why you did it, and how you did it with that client. Um, so let's get specific as to what achieving independence um, is, what it looks like. Um, it is assisting your client in achieving personal independence, like I mentioned, managing basic needs, focusing on meeting client needs, and decreasing barriers related to mental health. Um, so that's why we start, I think, the first week off the bat with assessing needs, once we know what those needs are, we can help the person to get those needs met, reduce barriers. And one of those needs may be achieving independence, being more um, self-reliant in certain areas, but mental health could absolutely be a barrier um, to a person achieving that goal. So kind of the overall goal for achieving independence is for eventually the client to do this task that we're working on with them independently or with some accommodation or with as minimal supports necessary. Um, so we want to work ourselves out of a job. We want to always be working towards discharge, and that should sort of be evident in uh, the tasks that we're supporting the client with and uh, sort of the overall goal that we're working towards uh, with the client. 
So why? Why is, you know, why was achieving independence even included in those 10 interventions in the Ohio Administrative Code? Um, hopefully, um, by working on achieving independence, we're supporting our clients to live with equal opportunities to everybody else, you know, other people who have and who do not have mental health diagnosis or developmental disabilities, and to thrive in their life on their own terms and on their own conditions. So what is important to them? Is it important for them to be able to take the bus either independently or with minimal supports? Is it important to them um, to maybe walk, just walk down the hallway, you know, independently or with, with minimal supports? What is important to them and how is mental health a barrier? And as we work towards achieving independence, you'll see along the way that even just little tiny accomplishments can help a client to build self-confidence, help them to feel empowered, more po have a more positive outlook on life and just kind of feel fulfilled. I know sometimes, especially working with clients who are in a residential facility, they may feel like there is nothing good about their situation. There is nothing positive that can come from it. But if we can just increase their independence a tiny little bit, as long as it's medically safe, and as long as it is um, appropriate for them and their needs and their functionings, that can maybe give them one kind of glimmer of hope. You know, being in this long-term care facility maybe isn't as bad as I think it is, and I can maybe make progress even if it is small. So that kind of sums it up with the last uh, PowerPoint um, point at the bottom there, that increasing independence can lead to a client feeling empowered. You know, I can do this, I can do this task, or I can do part of the task, and to advocate for themselves, to take action towards their goals, and ultimately experience, hopefully, a decrease in their mental health symptoms, and um, an improvement in their level of functioning. So essentially it kind of gives a client, even if it's a small amount of control, a certain amount of control over their life, over their future, over what happens to them on a daily basis. So those are some very important whys right off the bat. Um, a sense of control promotes feelings of achievement and self-worth, feeling in control and over their life, their actions, their choices, their situation can have a positive effect on a person's mental health. However, remember that the reason they have TBS, the reason they have case management is because they probably require your expertise, your support as a case manager um, to maybe brainstorm how are they gonna become more independent? What is involved in them becoming more independent? Um, they're looking to you really to have unique approaches, maybe in seeking out accommodations. They may not know um, that there are maybe things to help them shower more independently, like a shower chair or a, uh, you know, a shampoo visor or like we can maybe improve the lighting in the bathroom. Um, they may not have even thought about that, but that could lead to them being more independent um, and then also to overcome any mental health symptoms that may prevent them from being um, independent. So I wanna pause here. I've mentioned like five or six whys that achieving independence is important uh, to the clients that we support, but I wanna check in and see if I missed any or if you thought of any other reasons why supporting clients to be independent um, is important. You just go ahead and unmute or you can put it in the chat. Why achieving independence is important. I think it gives them a, a, a feeling of self-worth. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that they 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 can still do things even though, you know, everything's been against them, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Even if it's something small. Anything I think else? Particularly, uh, people in long term care with the uh the sense of control is mm -hmm. a big thing for them because when a lot of people complain about, you know, not really being in control of their medical care when they go in and stuff like that. So encouraging them and motivating them to to use that voice of theirs and advocate for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. They don't have control over much, but maybe let's focus on what they do have control of or maybe bring to, bring to their attention what they might not be aware of that they actually do have control over. That's a great point. Thank you, Dustin. You know, I have a client in one of my facilities that we're actually trying to help him find like um, assisted living placement. So just being able to teach him how to do certain things that he's not had to do for himself, like, you know, like giving him refreshers and stuff and making sure that when he is able to get out of the LTC that he's successful, you know, because his biggest fear is ending up back in 
Yeah. So the achieving independence, I think, will help him like be prepared for that next step. Yeah, that's a great point. Maybe if we can increase independence now, that can maybe prevent, you know, another um, another placement, another hospitalization, um, if they're regaining um, independence that they used to have, or maybe learning some of these skills for the first time. That's a great point. Thank you. Hola. Anyone else? Yeah. Why is achieving independence important for case management? Well, I was going to say, basically, um, think about it from the standpoint of one day, all of us are going to be in the same position, you know, some sooner than later. <laughs> and when you, when you think about someone giving up their whole entire home, everything that's in their home, their cars, yeah. I mean, you got to give up a lot to Absolutely. then come to a person home. And, and that's a surprise and that's a shock for most people. Yeah. You no, know, because now you don't have control of your bank account. You don't have a, you can't buy certain things. I know most of the people in my facility, they didn't get thirty dollars or fifty dollars a month. And that's a big to do for some folks. I mean, what are you gonna mm -hmm. do with thirty dollars? Right. So it's like no independence of, you know, the money that I get, how do I spend my money? And I'm just so used to buying stuff that I wanna buy. So now I don't have any control of my finances and how it's spent. So just the yeah. shock of you know, you going into a long-term facility and what you have to give up in order to be there. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I, I think you're describing about six different things in there that case managers um, are, 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 are good at. And that's empathy. I heard some empathy for this as a shock. You know, you're used to your life being one way. Now it's another way. And, you know, what might that feel like for that client? I also hear um, you kind of normalizing that, you know, a lot of people who come into a long-term care facility or who are hospitalized, you know, go through that shock. So while your unique situation, you know, is, is your own, lots of other people have also experienced something similar. So yeah, Frank, thank you for that. You touched on um, like six, you know, six different things that case managers do and also reflects back to why, you know, achieving independence is very important. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Okay. Anyone else? I don't want to leave anybody out. Why achieving independence with your clients can be beneficial before we go on. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you guys. I appreciate um, your contributions to the class are, um, are, are also important. Um, so some reminders um, as we're beginning treatment and also really as treatment continues, you know, pretty much every session, we want to look for opportunities for things that could contribute to increasing your client's level of independence. Again, for all of those reasons that we just mentioned, um, what could the client work towards doing on their own, even if it is just something small to begin with? Is there anything that could give them more of a sense of control? Is there anything that could um, help them to feel like their old self, kind of like what Frank uh, was explaining? Always at the beginning of treatment, you want to look at the diagnostic assessment and the psyche valve for kind of basic treatment recommendations and treatment directions that are based on medical necessity, but continue to assess for ways to improve and increase independence even as uh, treatment goes on. Um, so you see I underlined medical necessity there. I also want to check in real quick real quick with you guys and see um, if anybody wouldn't mind defining medical necessity for me or how you understand uh, medical necessity. And then we'll get into, again, the textbook definition here in a second. Uh, so any brave volunteers to explain medical necessity, how you understand it? Or you can put it in the chat. That's fine, too. I think it's those things that are like key or vital to goal completion, mm -hmm. like the, you know, um, finding things like, obviously if somebody's goal is to learn how to cook, doing something like showing them how to change oil, like that's not, I mean, I know that's a very <laughs> like broad example, but mm -hmm. it's just making sure that the activities and the things that you're doing with your clients are going to 
are necessary for that goal completion and not growth. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to explain it. So what you're working on needs to reflect back to what their goal is. And hopefully their goal is based on their mental health needs. So yeah, that's a great way to think about it. Um, should be based on also, the goal and objective. Yeah, go ahead. Also, also I think that it needs to, sorry. That's okay. Go ahead, Frank. I was just going to say everything, just anything that you work on, it has to go back and reflect to their diagnosis. You yes. know, basically, you know, you don't want to be, you know, doing something that they might be dealing with depression. Mm-hmm. Or they might be dealing, like, say, for instance, a person, you know, they're sleeping a lot. You notice in that they're in the bed a whole lot more than when their baseline was when you first get them. They always out and they're about. We always watch the TV. They talking about the latest show on television. They, mm-hmm. they, you know, they talking about this great TV show they just saw and they happy about it. Then all of a sudden, not in the bed all the time, and they stop talking about TV and they, that favorite show that they have. Yeah. You know, medical necessity is noticing that. Okay, this person, they might be going through a depression. You know, they're in the bed all the time. Yeah. So the activities that we work on should be reflective of them getting out of that, you know, the, the, that depression. Let's Absolutely. work on you getting out in the community. Let's work on you. Do you want to go outside? Do you want to do bingo? You Things that you want to do that's mm-hmm. medically necessity because you're dealing with depression. So let's get mm-hmm. you out of that funk of being depressed. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. any activity I work on should reflect in my diagnosis of the person. Yes, absolutely. Think of it like in medical terms, it could be dangerous if I'm taking a seizure medication, but I don't have seizures. So same kind of um, framework for mental health, you wanna make sure you're treating the symptoms that the client actually has and the diagnosis um, that they receive. So that's a great point, Frank. Um, Sarah, did you wanna make a comment? I was just basically wanting to say the same thing Frank said about relating okay. back to the diagnosis. Okay. Okay, great. So yeah, you're you're all right. Um, it needs to, the diagnosis should influence what the goal is. The goal should influence the interventions that we're providing. The interventions will influence the individual activities that we do with the client. Um, here's kind of the textbook um, dictionary definition, um, but you basically all describe that services are clinically indicated for the diagnosis and or treatment of a mental or behavioral health condition. What that means for you as a TBS in your notes, in your discharge summary, in your treatment plans, whatever kind of documentation you're doing, it needs to relate back to that. That's that golden thread. It should be from the beginning to the end. What are your client's clinical circumstances that support the need for the intervention or treatment that you're providing based on their diagnosis, based on the symptoms being addressed? What it boils down to is how did this intervention or activity help your client meet their goals, which I believe is what Autumn said, whoever spoke first, um, that was a great way to um, summarize that last bullet point. So medical necessity is kind of this word that I think we throw around a lot, like, oh, we need to show medical necessity, the golden thread of medical necessity, but not very often do we um, get very specific on what that actually means and what that actually looks like. So this is um, another item that we're looking for in your progress notes that you have doc- documented medical necessity. Um, that Not only is that providing good care to your client, but also it ensures that we can bill um, insurance, Medicaid for the services you're providing. So it's kind of two sides um, to that coin. Um, I think I already stated this, but as a refresher, as treatment continues, after you've met for weeks or months, increasing independence could maybe come up later in treatment um, as a starting point for services. It could happen at the beginning, happen at the middle, happen towards the end, because client needs change. Maybe their functioning decreases and we may have to work to overcome that. So take into consideration their symptoms or level of functioning. And maybe their readiness for change. Maybe they weren't ready to start working on um, a particular skill when you first met them, but now they're comfortable with you. They have a therapeutic relationship with you. They trust you. Maybe now they're finally ready um, to make changes or to learn a new skill. Maybe it won't seem as scary now that they have um, supportive helping professionals um, in their life. So great, great job, guys. Great job um, explaining medical necessity. Appreciate you guys sharing. Um, You guys gave some good examples. Um, so kind of getting into the middle of treatments, you know, by now you should know your client, 
um, like I said, really understand their needs because you have a good rapport, a good therapeutic relationship with them. So as you're having these um, sessions with your client, as time goes on, you may now hear them expressing new needs or different needs as far as independence, control in their life, mental health symptoms um, may be a barrier to them achieving this independence, either with your support um, or without it. Um, so my example, you know, for that is maybe your client has, um, you know, severe anxiety, you know, is that the barrier to them leaving their room? Is that the barrier to them, you know, getting on their bus um, and going grocery shopping on their own? And maybe because of that anxiety, they're not leaving their room because of that anxiety, they're not doing their own grocery shopping. If we can help them decrease anxiety, you know, if it's medically safe, perhaps they could start to do these things. So listen always for needs or areas where a person could become more independent. But I also don't want um, to neglect or to gloss over that there are often barriers to independence, not only their mental health diagnosis, but could also be a barrier to independence as far as your client's communication. Um, certain clients may become prompt dependent, and that is a barrier to independence. We'll talk about what that is here in a second, or they may actually have physical medical limitations or a disability that is a barrier um, to their becoming in more independent. So despite them wanting to do some of these things on their own, there may be um, a reason uh, that they cannot or have not yet. Again, looking to you as uh, the professional, as the expert to help them to overcome uh, some of these barriers. So let's get into each one of these and what that may look like um, as far as your clients that you're working with. So um, some communication barriers that you may notice is that your client may have um, difficulty expressing their needs. They may have expressive, um, maybe there's a trauma history, maybe it is because of their symptoms, but they just may have difficulty expressing their needs. That's why we need to be, you know, good active listeners, maybe talk to other providers, read their chart to perhaps get this information if your client is unable to express it to you. Maybe they have limited verbal skills. They may also have you know, a delay in processing, some kind of processing issue where they can't put words to what they're experiencing. Again, maybe because of a trauma response, they can't communicate to you what they wanna work on, what their needs are. They may also have um, difficulty understanding information being provided to them. They may not understand a lot of these big fancy words that we use. They may not use the word anxiety. Um, they may not use panic you know, as the description. Maybe they're feeling worried or maybe they're feeling concerned. So um, think about helping your client to overcome these barriers, explaining things in words or pictures or movies that they may understand more maybe than clinical. Um, explanations that we're providing. So just some things to keep in mind when it comes to communication. Um, a lot of times clients may become what we call prompt dependent, meaning they can perform an independent skill, but they don't do it until they've been prompted or they wait for a cue from a staff or a family member before you know they do the dishes, even though they could um, do it on their own. So just be on the lookout for your clients who are overly reliant on dependence or caregiver support. Um, look for things like your client not exhibiting a particular behavior without a cue from staff or others. Um, we want to, as we're working on these skills, not only teach them how to do it, but teach them how to know when to do it without maybe somebody being around or to maybe prompt themselves. Is this something you need to put on your calendar? Is this a post-it note that you need to put on your television to remind you um, to do a particular activity? Um, look for clients waiting for the prompt instead of just trying the task themselves on their own. This You can kind of bake in <laughs> to how you're teaching the skill, not only the skill, but how do you know when to perform it and prompting maybe themselves. Um, so other things to take into consideration that could be a barrier to independence is physical disabilities, medical conditions. Um, so people who have these, um, independence is still a critical skill where they live in their community, if they're working, if they're going to school. Um, however, they may require some extra support from us or some extra brainstorming on how to overcome um, some of these limitations. Also think about how are they going to continue to perform these skills as we fade out support or if support isn't there um, to provide guidance or prompting. 
Um, remembering that skills may not be fully mastered independently, but independence should be a lifetime goal. So maybe your client cannot set the entire table, but maybe they could put out the uh, the dishes and the placemat and the silverware and then work up to setting the entire table. So maybe start small and build from there, especially when people have you know medical issues or disabilities to take into consideration. Think also about physically. What is your client's environment like? And do their needs, or are their needs hindered you know, by their physical environment? So physical barriers are structural obstacles in a natural or man-made environment that could prevent physical mobility, you know, them moving around um, or accessing certain areas, um, things like steps, curbs that block a person with a mobility impairment from entering a building, using a sidewalk can be a physical barrier. If they're in a wheelchair, using a cane, we may have to take some of these um, into consideration. And again, support them to brainstorm how they're going to overcome this or how could we help them to advocate for themselves? Do they need us to advocate for them first and teach them those advocacy skills um, until they can do it on their own? So just, again, some things to keep in mind as you're working towards independence. What barriers to independence might be affecting your client? And then get specific. You know, what is it that prevents my client from getting on the bus? Is it anxiety? Is it a medical issue? Um, is it trauma? Um, is there some sort of physical barrier that prevents them from getting on the bus, just as an example? So I've been talking for a couple of minutes. Just want to check in and see if anything I mentioned reminded you of a client that you've worked with um, in the past or have supported and um, how you were maybe creative in helping them to overcome some of these barriers to still be independent. Um, did anything click for anybody or remind you of somebody you've worked with? Again, you can just unmute. Or go I ahead had a client in. who was wanting to go to Easter with her family, but she was worried about being able to get up the stairs. And she was thinking about canceling her Easter plans because she couldn't get up the stairs. Oh no. And we came up with a way that she might be able to get up them. What we came up with, she has a rollator. So um, we came up with having one of her family members put the rollator on the next step up and she could sit down in the rollator and swing her legs around onto the step and go eat up each step that way. And I came back the week after Easter and asked her how it went. And she said, it worked. I was able to go to Easter with my family. And she was just so happy about that. That's great. That's awesome that you're able to support them in that. Um, for those of us who don't know, myself including, what is a rollator? I don't know that I've ever... It's like a walker with four wheels and a seat. Oh, oh, I see. So she used that to get up. Yeah. Oh, okay. I never heard it called that before. Okay, great. What a great brainstorming. And, you know, what a great um, support that you provided and encouragement um, to help her have a good Easter with her family. That's excellent. What a great, what a great um, example. Um, anybody else? So I have a client. Um, she's an older lady, absolutely a sweetheart. Um, her faith is very big coping skill for her. And she used to teach Bible studies. Um, and like she kept saying how she wished she could do something like that at the facility. So we, um, I set up a meeting with the activity director for her and she talked to her and they're allowing her to do that like every other Thursday. Um, but then it was, well, I'm afraid, like, it takes a while to get me to get help in the mornings to get up. Like, what if I'm late? Like, so, you know, we brainstormed and came up with the idea of, okay, well, let's, why don't we lay our clothes out the night before, you know, so that that's one less thing that ha you have to do in the morning. Um, cause I mean, she is pretty self-sufficient. She just kind of needs stability help, mm -hmm. um, when she first gets up in the mornings. So just having that, like, you know, other than being sick and missing a, like a week, she does very, very well with it. Like I've went in and sat with her during her um, and now she's able to do it without me like being there to help her. They moved it to a day where I'm not there. So um, but just helping her brainstorm those ideas on how to be on time and things like that really changed her mindset. Yeah. That's a great example. I know it sounds very simple, you know, oh, you know, of course, put your clothes out the night before, or of course, you know, do some of these things ahead of time. But, you know, when you have anxiety, when you have depression, it may not even seem possible to get out of the house on time, or there's too much anxiety about doing it. So I really think that's where case managers, therapists, you know, play the important role is to, we're not really suggesting anything that's, you know, too 
to out there, but they may not because of their symptoms have thought of it or think it's possible. So I think that's a great example of something small that can really help somebody to become more independent and um, get where they want to get when they need to get there. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Um, anyone else? Maybe somebody who's not Frank or Sarah or Angela, somebody else maybe who hasn't shared. I'm sorry, I'll say so. <laughs> yeah, please, go ahead. I really don't have an actual, um, I have more of a question, but this is actually an idea that's something I want to do as far as independence. Now, one of my clients, um, he had a real bad brain injury. Mm. Um, and then on top of that, he also has, he's dealing with depression. He has a little bit of anger popping off. But we're trying to manage it. We're trying to manage. We're managing pretty good. But one of his biggest things, he is a funny guy. Everybody loves him. He's funny. He's and that's one of my biggest things. I keep joking with him, but I keep reminding him this. Like this, this is an idea. I kind of want you to get used to because everybody loves the fact that you make them laugh. So I um, collaborated with the um, activities coordinator, and I asked her. I said, "Well, maybe one day, because we're always thinking about different things to do in the activity room." And I said, "Maybe one day we can like put on like a comedy show, like a comedy skit or something." And he can actually, he can facilitate it for everybody just to keep him involved. Um, but I don't know if he'll really go through with it. That's awesome. That's a great idea. Yes, That's yes, amazing. Yeah, let us know how that goes. I'm curious. That's, that's a great idea. And that's absolutely related to independence. You know, um, you may be encouraging them or you may be kind of behind the scenes to help advocate, but it sounds like he's going to be the one literally like running the show. So what what a great way to feel good about being independent and, um, you know, basically doing, doing the work, you know, of, of running the show on their own. So that's great. What a good idea. All right. Well, thank you guys. Um, let's kind of get into um, the handouts that Donnie sent to you. I believe there was like nine at least um, that were sent. They're all sort of just different variations of interventions that you can use for helping your client to achieve independence. So um, we may not actually go over all nine of them in class, um, but what I hope you get is just kind of the main idea behind all of these, um, because it's just gonna be a great way to document really what they're already independent in and kind of positively reinforce that independence. It's also a great way to identify what can they do, maybe with some support, they need some help with it. And then also to identify maybe some areas that they need um, to work on. So um, that's kind of that idea that runs through all of these different um, activities that were emailed to you. We'll just kind of um, go over some of them so you have an idea of how you may use them um, in, in session with your clients. Um, so the first one is about the activity checklist, which I believe is um, handout 2.1. And uh, what you need to know about this is people with intellectual disabilities, cognitive delays, brain injuries, even just uh, mental health diagnosis in general, and because of their symptoms may need assistance, either learning or relearning how to complete daily activities, household tasks. Um, they're gonna feel a sense of satisfaction and a sense of accomplishment when they're able to learn things like maybe cooking, cleaning on their own, hygiene, um, just kind of those things that you and I take for granted. Um, so some examples of tasks, and these are not all inclusive. Your client may be very different. Their needs uh, may not match to this, but just some things to think about putting laundry um, in the washing machine, folding clothes, putting them away, preparing food, shopping for groceries, uh, completing self-care hygiene. You may want to think about the format of the checklist. It may include pictures and words. It may just be words. It may be just pictures. Um, so think ahead of time before you start teaching um, these independent skills, how does your client learn best? We're gonna talk about uh, learning styles a little bit later um, in the series, um, but maybe get their input and how would you prefer to receive information? Pictures, words, both. Um, so before you begin to teach a task, you also wanna think about how am I gonna teach it? Break it down into a series of steps that are kind of manageable for your client to handle. Um, while you, you know, have been washing your clothes for so long, you might not even think about all the steps that are involved. If you actually sit down and think about all of the steps that go into washing your clothes, there's quite a few. Your clients may need more support um, in learning it and also learning, you know, what does it mean to, um, to 
maybe sort the clothes, you know, what, what, what's white, what, what are colors, what needs hot, what needs cold, you know, we already kind of know this information, but they may need some more education about it. So be specific about how to sort clothes. Let me show them how to read the tags on their clothes, demonstrate the task, then have the client try it themselves. Once they're proficient at that portion of all of those steps, move on to the next step and then continue to practice them in order. But I will caution you, you know, only keep practicing as long as your client is engaged. And I would say, make sure it is a skill that is important to them. If they could care less about how to do the laundry, they're probably not going to be engaged or interested in it. Um, so only do it as long as they're into it, make it a positive experience, give some positive feedback, give some praise as they master the different steps along the way. And think about doing it over several sessions. You know, you may not teach how to do laundry from beginning to end in an hour. It may take a couple sessions. They want to spread it out um, over a couple weeks, uh, depending on your client. Think about role playing. Um, if you're teaching skills that may occur, for example, in public, where they may face distractions, you may want to role play. How could they stay on task as far as maybe grocery shopping if they're distracted by somebody they know in the grocery store? So maybe role play that with them. So for example, um, if they're buying groceries, practice what they should do. What would they say if they saw a neighbor to address the neighbor if they'd like and then get back to the task at hand of grocery shopping? So demonstrate again in role play, greeting the person and then transitioning back to where they left off on their shopping list. So role play is really great. A lot of people respond well to role play because I think it, pre it prepares them for kind of real life um, situations. Um, another handout is uh, handout 2.7, which is a household chores activity checklist. This actually, I think is one of my favorites because it lets you look at many different daily activities that you could potentially assist your client uh, with doing themselves independently. Also gives you a chance to assess um, what they need help with, what they can do independently, what they can do uh, with some support. So here's a screenshot of it. You can see for each skill, I can use common kitchen tools, a knife, measuring cups, timers. I can do it well, I can do it, but it's hard, or maybe I need support or I need a lot of help to do it, or maybe I can't do it. So it's a great way to positively reinforce skills I already have while at the same time identifying some areas to work on. Um, another handout that we provided is handout 2.9, which again is pictures and words of how to brush your teeth. So again, maybe people with a brain injury or people who have a developmental disability may not know all of the steps that go into brushing their teeth. So what a better way than with pictures and words um, to demonstrate exactly what we mean by brushing your teeth. And it is uh, sort of there for you outlined one, two, three, all the way to nine um, as a great teaching tool, both pictures um, and words, depending on your client's learning style. One approach that was not included um, in the handouts, because I think it's like 100 pages long, is a social stories workbook. Um, I'll email it to you after class um, so that you have that for reference. Um, you should already kind of be familiar with social stories from the first workbook that you went over during your new hire training. Uh, there were several social stories in that workbook. We're just gonna kind of revisit it because it is a great way um, with pictures and words or pictures and words uh, to show new concepts, especially new concepts related to um, achieving independence. So you can use social stories as well to show your client what goes into a particular um, skill or how do people do things like brush their teeth or why is it important uh, to brush your teeth? It's also helpful um, for teaching maybe more social skills, how to ask for assistance, how to respond to a change in routine, um, so on and so forth. Um, if you Google, you know, social stories and a particular situation, maybe social stories and weddings or social stories and restaurants. Um, there are a ton out there already on the internet. Please take a look at them. Make sure they're appropriate first. If you're a client, run them by your supervisor as well for a second opinion. Um, I'm just going to have you look at one that is in the workbook uh, real quick to give you an idea um, of what a social story might look like. Got too many things open here. <laughs> Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, so this workbook that we're going to send to you is probably definitely more for children, but I just wanted to get the idea of some topics that could be good for a social story or um, just to maybe get your 
creative juices flowing on social stories that you may want to actually create um, for working with your clients. So this is about going to the doctor. Uh, sometimes I go to the doctor's office when I am sick, the doctor can help me. And you know, every every step along this way, doing a social story, whether it's pictures or words, your clients may have questions. Great, great way to have a discussion. I sometimes get scared. I have to wait in the waiting room. What's a waiting room? Go into what a waiting room is. When the nurse calls my name, mom or dad or staff will go with me. I might get weighed. They might check my height, just to kind of give people an idea of what to expect, to see how much they've grown, see if there's any issues. Uh, when I get to the doctor's room, I will sit on the table. So again, to prepare people, especially with anxiety or maybe has never um, had this experience before, to what to expect. So um, hopefully you guys get the idea, pictures and words, teaching a new concept. A lot of them um, are geared towards um, independent skills. So that's social stories. Okay, just a couple last thoughts about teaching independence. Um, you're never really too young or too old to start learning independence. You can always tailor it to meet that person's developmental level, um, what would be appropriate for them to learn for independence. Think about using visual cues, pictures, diagrams to reinforce concept, concepts so we're really clear what we mean when we say, you know, clear off the table. That could be one thing to one person and something different to the next. And then also technology can be useful in facilitating this. Um, again, I encourage you to Google, for example, social stories, um, access maybe some clip art to create your own social stories with pictures and words, um, but don't be afraid to maybe also show a video, you know, a quick clip on YouTube of somebody washing dishes or clearing uh, the table sometimes can illustrate it much better than we can just verbally. So keep in mind people's learning styles and how you're gonna communicate that information. Um, so again, just real quick, I wanna have time for documentation. Um, thoughts, reactions, comments, questions, just about the couple handouts that we talked about uh, just now to teach independence. Okay, it may look different. You know, again, depending on your client, if you're working with somebody in a day in employment services setting, different independent skills are possible to be taught in that situation versus in the community, versus in a long-term care facility, versus in the office. Um, so this is not meant to be um, you know, everything that you need to know about achieving independence, but I hope you take these ideas and then apply them and what would make sense for your clients. So use a variety of techniques, practice, practice, practice to reinforce, and don't forget to praise your clients as they make progress along the way, very important. All right, so let's talk about documenting how you would provide the service or the intervention of achieving independence. Always wanna link the interventions and activities that you're providing back to the mental health symptoms. That is essentially medical necessity. And then also be clear what the specific barriers are that you're supporting the client to overcome. Um, do they need to do some deep breathing to reduce anxiety to get on the bus? We're not just teaching somebody to get on the bus there has to be that mental health component as well, because we are providing mental health case management. Um, when we are doing our progress note, again, just a reminder, we need both the intervention and then the specific activity that you engage the client in. Um, if you're unable to choose it from these uh, check boxes, please mention it in the body of the note and what um, independent skill you engage the client in, if you don't see it listed there. And then let's talk about Oh yeah, go ahead. Did you, I'm not sure if I missed it. Did for the um, check boxes, mm -hmm. is there a specific one that we would do for if we were teaching people about, oh, never mind at the top. Mm -hmm. Okay. Activities of daily living skills. Yeah. Never mind. But even within that, like if you, if you want, and stuff. Yeah. If you want to mention um, in the body of the note, you know, client engaged in um, completing household check, household chore checklist. That tells us exactly, you know, what activity you engage the client in to teach activities of daily living or, you know, like you mentioned hygiene, was it teeth brushing or what was the actual um, yep. activity that you engaged in? Just make sure you mention that. Yep. Good question. Good Thank question. You. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the client response, again, should just be the client's response to the interventions and activities that you checked below. Um, you can use the check boxes here to give us a sense of to what extent did they participate, other um, responses from the client, were they able to identify needs along the way as you taught 
independent skills? Are they able to identify symptoms that this um, independent skill can help them to reduce? Give us a little bit more information there. Don't be afraid to use those check boxes, but let's talk about what actually goes in the client response box. So here, I'll just go ahead and read it for you in case you're on your phone. Uh, Sally shared anxiety about slipping in the tub, agreed that applying anti-slip strips would help her feel safer, as would getting a shower chair. Sally shared due to a dexterity issue, washing her hair is often difficult for her. She gets shampoo in her eyes, and so she often skips it. Sally shared that after a shower, she does enjoy the clean feeling and is more likely to want to socialize. However, noted, it's just so much work, and sometimes I don't have the energy for it. Sally stated she's proud of making progress with brushing her teeth and using deodorant and noted an increase in this based on her hygiene chart. Um, so this is really the best example for this uh, uh, progress note because it includes client quotes. So we're being person-centered. We're also using her name. It references anxiety. It says right there, Sally shared anxiety and also kind of the effect that it has on her life. When she doesn't shower because of the anxiety, she doesn't want to socialize. Um, she doesn't have the energy for it. So maybe also some depression might be going on there. And then we also have the specific activity. Sounds like we're checking off on her hygiene chart, how often um, she's performing her hygiene activities. Um, so that is also listed um, and highlighted in yellow. So for all those reasons, um, this is kind of the best example. And I know Sally's not real. It may look different. Uh, with your client, but that's kind of what we're looking for as far as the components of the note. And then for the plan, we want to know not only what people are working on between this session and the next, but how are they going to accomplish it? When should they be performing those skills? With whom should they be performing those skills? How are we going to make sure that progress is made? So our, our plan here, I'll read you the highlighted one. Sally agreed to budget and shop for a shampoo visor to keep shampoo out of her eyes, anti-slip strips to shower, to help prevent falls in a shower chair with support from her staff to decrease anxiety. So we're not just getting these things or helping Sally to get these things to be a nice person. It's linked to her anxiety associated with showering. Um, and then to kind of put it into practice, Sally agreed to plan two social outings during the next week and to shower before each outing to overcome symptoms of depression and increase socialization. So this is real specific. What exactly is she going to do how is she going to do it? Who's going to help her? And the kind of the rationale, we're, tr we're trying to help her overcome anxiety and we're trying to help her decrease her symptoms of depression and have some more um, socialization in her life. Um, so we got five minutes left. Just real quick, um, always wanna be working towards discharge. That could look like planning how your clients are gonna maintain or increase their independence once they're done with you. Does that require referrals from you to other services? Do they need accommodations set up before we discharge them? Always wanna reassess needs. This models for them, how they could advocate to get those needs met. Also may give you an idea about what services may be appropriate for them to refer them to after discharge so they can maintain their progress. Uh, towards independence. You can have this conversation about independence with a client, with their guardian, with their staff. Probably a good idea to take a team's approach um, towards maintaining or improving independence. And other things you can do um, is to maybe complete a SNAP assessment and then include your findings on the discharge summary and share that information with your client and their perhaps guardian as well. Um, so just a couple minutes left. What questions do you guys have about achieving independence? And do you feel as though you could implement some sort of achieving independence activity with your client um, to do a progress note about for next week? Just go ahead and unmute or you can put it um, in the chat is fine. Okay, so I have a client who is struggling with depression. It's the same one he's trying to get out of a long-term care facility into assisted living. Um, and one of the goals that we have set is for him to be able to get up and walk around by himself because he feels like nobody has the faith in him to, to actually succeed. Um, and they say the large part, like part of that is because he's not active. Mm -hmm. So in the in achieving independence, like it's okay for the plan to say like, he's going to start by walking with me, like a couple of times during session to, and then hopefully gradually be able to get out and walk by himself. But that's still the considered the achieving independence, even though he's doing it with me, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first, I would want to make sure okay. medic medically he's cleared 
Um, so maybe checking in with a nurse, um, checking in with some orders to make sure that he medically is safe enough to do that. Um, he is. He but just once... is. <laughs> <laughs> that's sounds like, like, sounds like there's some anxiety about it or yeah, yeah depression and motivation to actually do it. okay so once he's medically cleared to do that then absolutely yeah so we don't expect people to just off the bat start doing a new skill that they've never done or um to restart doing something that they have stopped because of anxiety or because of depression so absolutely there's baby steps literally like along the way that we can support somebody with um with support from us, so we can maybe help them make arrangements and brainstorm who else could you maybe take a walk with? Could you schedule a walk, you know, with a peer down the hall? Um, and then eventually the hope is he'll be doing it either completely independently or if safety is a concern, you know, who could support him in making arrangements to make sure that he's safe. Um, so yeah, I don't expect people to do it right off the bat um, completely on their own, but that that's probably the goal, you know, as long as it is safe uh, for that person. So that's a good question. Anybody else? Questions about achieving independence and what that might look like as you're going to implement the implement this this week with your with your clients. Okay, I have more, it's more of a question. Okay. To see how I can kind of implement this, but one of my clients, his goal, even though I know I can't do this for him, but one of his goals is to um kind of restore his relationship with his children or okay. even just to have a, a conversation with his his children or whatever so honestly I'm thinking my my main thing is take baby steps take baby steps and with that with that being said I'm like well maybe you need to try to establish have making conversation first with them whether that's on the phone because I don't I doubt it if it's kids come and visit him in a facility but that's kind of tough it's kind of tough because you know he's probably going to say well they can call me they don't call me mm -hmm. and it's just it's it's rough yeah yeah that's a tough one it probably is so overwhelming to think about oh I want to have a relationship you know with this person to think about that as being the goal at once so yeah you're absolutely right like what might be the first step towards it do you have their phone numbers um, you know, what might you talk about? Could you make a list of three things that you might talk about, you know, with yeah. that person? Um, could you text, maybe start out first texting them? Um, could you role play with me? What you want to say with that person? You yeah. know, what is the barrier? What, what has kept them thus far from picking up the phone and making the first phone call? So maybe yeah, back, back pedaling a little bit, what's been their barrier to doing it by me. themselves and kind of doing it maybe along with them or practicing, um, with, you know, doing a role play, maybe practicing with them what they might want to say. And then, you know, not, not going too fast, you know, again, they're not going to have a relationship with this person tomorrow, but what, you know, like you said, baby steps could they take today to work towards it? That's a great, you might not think about that being an independent skill, but it, it really is because something's preventing him from yeah. doing it from something's preventing him from yeah. doing it on his own at this moment so that's a great yeah, he wants to make everybody laugh at the same time so i'm like what's Aww. going on why are you trying to make everybody laugh right but, okay yeah, i understand okay <laughs> all right guys well i hate to cut this short but i actually have a four o'clock tbsu class that i gotta get to um after my four o'clock class is over so at five i'll send the video um if donnie hasn't already sent you the quiz um i will send that to you at five um, but great discussion to get today, guys. Good examples. Um, I can tell you guys are thinking about how you're going to use this with your clients. So that's the whole point, really, of TBSU. Um, so direct any questions either towards me or Donnie. And Donnie should be back with you guys uh, next week. So have a great week. And take care. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.